Hi, my name is Michael Goodfriend. I'm the executive producer of the Play On podcast. And you know, all of the Play On podcast series begin with one person, and that is the translator of the Shakespeare play that we are creating the series out of. Everything begins with that person. I usually get in touch with that person. I say, hey, are you into this? Would you like to do it with us? Hopefully they say yes. And then we go from there. We build our team out from there. Play On commissioned all of these plays from 36 contemporary American playwrights, dramaturgs, scholars, people who are steeped in theater in some way. Uh, and Sean San Jose happens to be the translator of the Coriolanus series. He's an accomplished actor, director, theatrical producer, storyteller. He's based in the San Francisco area, uh, where he is the artistic director of the very, very famous Magic Theater. He's also the co-founder of Campo Santo, a group that has developed, produced, and premiered nearly 100 new works for and by people of color since 1996. Now, I'm honored to have Sean San Jose with me today to talk about Coriolanus and many other things that I'm sure we're going to get into. So, Sean, welcome. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you, Marco. appreciate everything about this process and I'm glad we get to have another chance to talk. Likewise, I, uh, you know, you and I hit it off right away from the start. I could feel the good vibe uh, talking to you. Okay, look, today is the day that we launch episode seven of Coriolanus. That's the final episode of Coriolanus. By the time people hear this interview, they'll have had a chance to hear the whole thing. And maybe not coincidentally, it's the day that we heard the verdict of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Discuss. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, uh, a horrifically great place to jump off, you know, uh, for the for the piece, just to give a little uh, uh, overview of it, you know, I really think the piece starts, you know, we definitely gonna get into this vile shit with Carl Rittenhouse for sure, but in terms of the process of Coriolanus, it really start for me, the, the one person is Louis Douthat who conceived of the project for Play On, which, you know, I, I say that to say she is the one that, that brought these playwrights to, to Shakespeare. And this is someone that's worked most notably in Shakespeare and in new plays. And so I think one of the things that's most exciting about the process, any process with the play and with the, the pieces is that it, it really, for me, is the only time I've experienced Shakespeare and the new playmaking process uh, simultaneously so that you can be a new play creator, which is really much more about more immediately reflecting the world that you live in. And, and yet with this process, we have, you know, all the gifts of, of the Shakespeare story, language, characters, conflict, et cetera. So when Louis had asked, you know, said, I'm, I'm, I'm cooking up this new thing. I really only, I've only, I've had the pleasure of only doing new work. And so I, I happened to be up in that, the bucolic town of Ashland, Oregon, as you know well, Michael. Oh, yeah. So l looking around the four streets there and we found one of the streets, I'm a, you know, I'm a city mouse. So I, I went crazy about after day 1.5 up there, as lovely as it is. <laughs> and she was like, well, I'm <clears throat> cooking up this new thing. Would you be interested? And the only context I had is this, the amazing, you know, the black swan, the brown swan lot labs up there, the amazing labs that you know much better than I, mm -hmm. of, of the new playmaking process. So I was like, whatever it is, I'm in, I'm down. And then she was like, well, we do <laughs> these Shakespeare things. I was like, uh, where's, where are we going with the conversation? What are you talking about? <laughs> and at the time she hits, you know, I, I, I thought the idea was that it was going to be like um, adaptations of Shakespeare. When the company, our, our, our work with Campo Santo, we, we work with a lot of things. And one of the things I, I, I like doing personally, too, is um, um, 
the idea of the, the loose or the larger idea of adaptation. So I was super right. I was like, that's great. Cool. And then when it came down to it, it really was, bro, you are translate. It's a translation. And there were some very severe, not severe. Um, well, for my little brain, it was severe, but there were some real tight sort of strictures. It was like, it, it's a, it's a direct one-to-one -one translation. There is no adapting, first of all. There is no cutting of characters, no changing of names, no changing, of, no cutting of dialogue. In other words, you can't be like, oh, that thing is like, don't make sense. Can we just move it or remove it? And so it wasn't that. So it took me quite a long time. But anyway, the, the, the thing that got me excited about it was that Louis was like, look, man, it's early on. You can pick any, any of the things that you want to pick. And I was like, well, I, I certainly don't want to work with any of the ones that are like, you know, the more classic joints, whether it would be the Romeo and Juliet or, you know, Otello or Julius Caesar or whatever. And so for some reason, I, I had asked her, I said, what, what about Coralinus? And she was like, Ugh. <laughs> she was probably like, sucker. And, and, and so this just came out, like Coriolanus just came out of the blue in that sense, she didn't come to you saying, no, hey, have you thought about Coriolanus? No, let, she, let's, let's be honest, Coriolanus. Corey is definitely not what you think of first when you think of Shakespeare, right? Well, the, the funny thing is, Marco, because because I'm not I'm not like you. I'm not I I I have never performed Shakespeare. I'm not versed in it. Um, I, I could probably say that I'm not really uh, uh, I'm not really an audience member for it. I don't. If I weren't in the in the world, like oh, I'm gonna go see my, you know Michael and Nancy do their thing, and and they happen to be doing Shakespeare. To be quite honest, that would be what would get me there as opposed to, oh, there's a new version of um, Pericles. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a hater. I just, it, it doesn't resonate with me in an immediate way. So th the reason Coriolanus, my ignorance sort of played into it in a certain regard in that I was looking at more uh, larger thematics of it. So I was like, well, what do I think this one is about? And in my head still, Michael, I was still thinking like I would approach any work. Like what, what is, how can I enter the world so it resonates with the world that I live in? And like, you know, Romeo and Juliet has just been, it's been fake adapted and, you know, superficially adapted and filmically adapted, things like that. So it's been done it's every, like, every conceivable Yeah, way. and so like it, it, none of those uh none of those any of those versions of it resonate more with me so i was thinking what are the things that would what could enter me into the world better and there was something about uh again like i was thinking well thinking ahead this is <laughs> not a good way to do a <laughs> translation i was like after i finished this easy translation of shakespeare <laughs> which is like you know my first mistake I should I should pick something that I would like to continue the, the themes of and, and exploring the same. So what is going to be thematically interesting? And then what in, in some sort of way could I even loosely structure an adaptation? And the only thing that I mean by adaptation is like, in what way is that world resonant with the world that I know? And, and so, Sean, was this based on... Uh... A synopsis you read did you know anything about the play before you just or did you kind of throw a dart at the wall and be like Coriolanus uh, how, like, I think there was the, the vaguest there had to be the vaguest sort of memory uh I had a homeboy was in um the Coriolanus at the public the Stephen Burkhoff director that Christopher Walken was Coriolanus so I had uh -huh. this kind of like this very vague imagined version of what what that could represent and so you had just heard about that production yeah and so uh -huh. i had imagined oh it could be this it could be that so somewhere in the you know going back in campo santo we had done someone had asked us many many years ago they were like hey would you ever do a shakespeare and i was like what no well, did you not read yeah. our shit like no what why we are you do new theater yeah new, like, uh, develop what? new works and we ended up with this idea and, and talked with with someone in san francisco and it, it, and they were like, well, you could, you could do anything you want with it. And I was like, could it be done with no lines from Shakespeare? And they're like, yeah, I think that could happen. But so, you could do anything you want with the play, Corey. Yeah, Davis. and and it 
and I, I bring all this up to say is it so this is where my my brain worked around it. So in Campo Santo, we worked with the great writer Naomi Izuka. Mm-hmm. And the way that Naomi thought about it is still in my brain, you know. So I said, Naomi, what if we what if we did this Hamlet thing? And Naomi was a little bit like, I mean, she's an amazing writer with an amazing mind. So, and she had done different versions of adaptations, not Shakespeare, and was like, well, what, what we have to figure out what what is what is what does the kingdom mean to you, you know, and then we, we can start there because I I don't know what that what that means then I don't know how we'll ever get into it. And yep. she said, you know, and so I thought, yeah, I can't get over the, the royalty thing. I can't get over the kings and queens part because I just don't understand that. And I was like, you know, in what world, in what world would a brother kill his brother for, for, for power? And then I thought of, of our worlds, you know, uh, some, some of the worlds here. And it got me rolling in that way. I say a lot to say that, when I when I was thinking about this, I was really thinking not at all. It was sort of like this is where it's get deleted. I, I wasn't thinking of Shakespeare so much. <laughs> the messages in, in this interview are are not the opinions of playing on. Oh my uh, no, so so you're saying when you approached Coriolanus, you weren't really thinking of Shakespeare. You were thinking of a I story was thinking that... of of and not even the story per se. To be honest, I didn't know thoroughly the story as much. But An open more, field. You you had a clean slate. Yeah, and my my thought was like, well, it's about this guy that you know gains this power, and what does it mean to have power? And and I just sort of not vaguely, but I said, well, let me look at the fir- the first scene. Um, and in the first scene, that was that was really all uh, I went from there. Because in the first scene, they're out in the middle of the street. It's like you know, the 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 public square or whatever you would you know would call it. You know, and they say we're you know we hungry, man. Yeah. And you you the the rich people have all the food, and we don't got no food. So give us our food. And he, then in comes in comes Coriolanus back from war as the hero, and and then it's immediately set up between people in power. Any further, let me talk. Talk, talk. You all really are ready to just die before starving to death? First, you all know Caius Martius is the chief enemy of the people. And the people's opinions shift constantly. They're easily manipulated. They're, yes. they're, they go from one extreme to another, as does Coriolanus, it seems. Or, yes. or, 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 I mean, it's... It's a play that I knew nothing about, and thanks to you and thanks to uh, Play On, I have been steeped in it now for the past three, four months, right? And I'm struck always by how immediate it is. Bam, yeah. takes you, puts you right into the world. You, it's a gut punch from the beginning to the end. It doesn't let up. Uh, and, and it's like you've been taken through a, a, a whirlwind by the time you get to the end. I want to yeah. know, um, Sean, what did you, what do you feel like you entering into it? How, what did you learn about the character Coriolanus and what did you learn about yourself through the process? Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't know how much I learned about m- myself, which is in, in kind of an odd thing to say, you know, in your work, it's so much about, because it's so much about, you know, delving into an issue or a question of the world we live in, inevitably, you're going to learn something from the people you work with. Part of it was that I was tasked to do a thing in a process that I'm I'm less familiar with, you know what I'm saying, Michael? You know, like, here's the script, come back with, you know, a draft, and we see you in, you know, whenever you finish it, and hurry up, because you're taking a long time finish it <laughs> but the thing that i learned about cory Lanus is just like that's that's when i was that's when i was in i was like you know this is so um compelling to me because it's someone that i mean that motherfucker keeps it so real mm-hmm. and in, in one regard you're like that's super honest and then the immediate you know next breath you're like he's so real he just revealed 
how vile he is, you know. He's so real. He's has great integrity for his beliefs, you know. And so I found that really, I found it really interesting. And I found that in relationship to people's needs, you know, really uh, painful, you know, that we're so hungry, literally hungry, and hungry for any kind of place, any kind of representation that whoever is going to come strongest on the mic, they'll be like, take it. And whatever it is in this moment that we is like, that that's where the shine is. Put that, that person up. I mean, how we got, you know, devils in office. It's how we got that piece of vile shit that was running this country. It's how the most awful president ever, Reagan, was here. You know, these, these clowns, these ciphers of you know, evil. Anyway, I say that to say that 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 magic trick, whatever it is, mixed with our need is is really it's both real and very scary and compelling. Um, and I think sometimes we think of it as as far away, you know, like um, a Filipino and Puerto Rican. So like the politics in, in the Philippines is, is our obviously represents the same kind of you know, horrible magician chip, you know, we're going to put an actor clown in office. Let's open that up because I want to talk to you about, but you, we, we've kind of hovered here in where we are now, right? Mm-hmm. With, with episode seven and Coriolanus. And this is sort of like the latest manifestation mm-hmm. of your work, at least in the, in, 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 the, in media, right? So can you take us back to the beginning of your journey? Uh, as an artist, you say you're Filipino and Puerto Rican. Um, uh, where were you born? How did you end up uh, at the Magic Theater where you are now? Just yeah, take us it, on that journey. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm I'm from San Francisco. You know, uh, I, you know, Chada immigrants. It turns out, you know, grew up poor. As, you know, we later learned out. Come from a big family. My mother was one of eight. I'm one of 30, 30 grandchildren of my my 30 buckle. grandchildren. Yeah, my grandmother, my the greatest, the greatest that ever walked this thing. And you know, <laughs> I grew up here in San Francisco with this great big family in this great, beautiful city. And I never um I was not a, a, a theater person at all. Um and just came to theater, you know, fairly late, like 17 or 18. Someone had taken me to the magic theater of all places to see a play and then seeing that uh, what, I think, do you remember what play it was it was a sam shepherd play it was like a a, a a um um it had to be um curse of the starving class yeah, yeah there you go hey, yeah wow, hit it on yeah. the first one All right. yeah yeah <laughs> hey, perfect curse of yeah. the starving class Coriolis. yeah no for real <laughs> and it was such a magical m- moment to see that you know just to 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 crystallized the moment where you know I sat amongst people that I didn't know didn't look like me didn't sound like me didn't dress was like it a me. school pl- like a school field no nah, it was like a night joint you know so there was it was even more um it was Maybe. even yeah and it was also more um alienating for me so it wasn't like I didn't have my crew I wasn't with the class class of students I had never I had never experienced the thing where you go and a troop comes into your school and plays in your auditorium or oh, it was at your school. They came to nah, you. nah, we went oh, up there. Oh, oh. I had never experienced so I, I say that oh. to say like I had never I went to San Francisco uh you know public schools. We oddly we didn't have and we didn't have I don't recall any plays or performances like that. I mean we had band and dance and stuff like that, but I don't remember any any theater just, stuff so i just like I just, want, walking down the street and just said <clears throat> hey i'm gonna go in no i kind of was interested in the idea of, of, of theater at the at, at the time I, I had gotten into i was really a big uh reader i grew up near a library and so i went to the public library a lot and i had gotten into it and, and then i just fell into um to to theater by by way of the text and the idea of it and so someone said well you can get into it you got to read you know their plays that are actually those things and you read the text and then they perform and you can see it live so I went and you know it was all she wrote after that this this notion that we can gather in a place and that 
as different and as alienating as the surrounding may be, once the moment starts, when people are reflecting the real world, there's just this incredible moment where you consciously or unconsciously realize we're actually all in the same world together. And that was very profound to me, not articulated emotionally, obviously at the time, but later, but also that that, that was the goal that, the mirror was working back and forth as opposed to this notion that it was imagined or make-believe. And so, so you get to you, Shakespeare, you know, that it was far away and pretend and something you could never have experienced because it was hundreds of years ago. But actually it wasn't that at all. It was like, it's a house. It don't look like your house, but you understand that it's a house. There's a family having an interaction. You understand the family interaction. They're white. You're not white, but you can understand the dynamics. The emotional, yeah. the emotional. Yeah. Life and then once you're into that part, it could take you anywhere. And as you know, in, in the shepherd, all of a sudden after they're talking about something, you know, um, that lets you understand, oh, this is a family relationship. And they're talking about something within the family. I heard the door of the Packard open, pop of metal, dogs barking down the road, door slams, feet, heart pounding, sound of door not opening for kicking door. Man's voice, dad's voice, dad calling mom, no answer, foot kicking, foot kicking harder, wood splitting, man's voice in the night, foot kicking hard right through the door, one foot right through the door, bottle crashing, glass breaking, fist through the door, man cursing, man going insane, man yelling, shoulder smashing, whole body crashing, man throwing wood, man and throwing all of a sudden up, just explodes cops, and, dad, talking and, you were, and, and that was it for you. You you went to this. You went by yourself. You're you're affected emotionally. You you get a sense of kind of uh, comfort, maybe, or or companionship, or recognition in this play. And and then you're you know at that point you're going to dedicate your. This is it for you. You're going to go here, in in this direction in your life. Yeah, I wouldn't call it comfort even. I, I would yeah. say that it, it was it was a moment where I recognized there was, there was a place you could go and, and release these, these feelings. Recognition. These, yeah. And that there was a, an acknowledgement of the existence of said feelings, conflicts, worries, beauties, joys, nightmares. And, you know, I grew up, like I said, in, 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 in with a larger family and, before the term people of color, we were just minorities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and with all that, that the worldly baggage of that, I think one of the things that, that the way it affected me is I also didn't have a, a, a sense of, of self within that. And what I mean to say is like, I didn't have a sense. I was a shy dude. I knew my function in the family. I wasn't the smartest. I wasn't the prettiest. I certainly wasn't the toughest. So I was somewhere near the other end where I tried to be quiet, tried to be more polite. I wasn't quite that. And then when you when you try and adjust that to the, the rest of the world, it is a hard placement because all these other things come. It's like, yeah, but you, you know, you don't look like us. You don't talk like us. And we want you to do this. And so you get caught with all these feelings that just live inside. And then I come back to a family, you know, we have a family, you know, trying to grind and stuff and as many beautiful adaptable things we are i think the the male person of color you know dealing with emotions grow, especially growing up is you know is, is not solved it certainly wasn't solved in, in in my lifetime i say all that to say is that i came in here with you know like boxes and boxes of confusions and hurt and and, and pain and misunderstandings and then i was like Mama, just talk about this. He, oh, I, I, I'm weird, but I'm not like insane. You know, that pain isn't unique. It's real though. And so that, again, I don't know how conscious it was at that time, Marco, but I, I knew there was something about the same interest we have of falling into a book and you read it and you go, oh, my goodness, I'm going to live in here. I'm going to live in these pages. And I think there was a, a way that that transferred to going, oh, that feeling of, of existing in a world where I can express and explore. It, it can happen there. That's what I think that's what these people do, you know. And so, so 
yeah, and, from and there. It, did it did it go for you uh, first into writing or into acting? Or was yeah, it, it was all it was all acting. No, I think this notion of uh, of any of it, I I didn't know anything about the structure of it. So I think that uh, I just started a- acting, and I think that that, as you know, Michael, the 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 those first moments that you do it, and again, you're talking about you know me for me uh i don't want to say damaged but certainly confused maybe a little fucked up at the time and then to suddenly be able to connect ignite emotions and feelings that was like it was a wrap i was like oh my goodness you know I, you, you found know, your I, people you found your place and it, it, yeah i mean i think later was the part where i found my people i found my place and then after doing work for a while then you, you you're interested in painting the picture more accurately so yeah, after that, yeah, yeah no go ahead no go ahead i was gonna say so so did it did did you start auditioning professionally right away did you start doing school plays did you uh, what no i mean i was like right at the end of school and i had i had, I had done school there was a, a, a high school thing that i, I did and it was all a new place for, for young people so i was doing that and I was like, this is the only thing I want to do. This is the only thing I, I want to do. <clears throat> and and then I just did what, what the, I mean, the great thing about it was there was a high school teacher, Dan Caldwell, and he had, he, he had sort of introduced the notion of theater to folks, gave you new plays to do, but it was all the Stanislavski shit and, you know, Uta Hagen. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that to be like, it was all that. What it did for me was it let me know off top was like, hey, man, you may be fucked up and you may be irresponsible and you may like to, you know, party. But when we're in here, here's what you got to do. You could answer these 10 questions before you enter the scene. You better know what your your motivation is. I want to know your character bar, woo, 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 all this stuff. And so it, it was able to corral all the, you know, so it wasn't merely... I have all these fucked up feelings, Mark, when I go to this place and it's like a faux therapy session and I can just go off, you know, you, you get know, to put it, your, you get to, to, to leave all that aside, <clears throat> go into a character, work on behalf of a character and all that, that, that other stuff. It's just, it goes into the creation of the character maybe, but it's all on behalf of that writer. That writer, Yeah. That player, and let you know, story. it lets you know right off top too. There's, there's, there's discipline to it. Mm-hmm. And then later comes, craft. you know, craft, you know, yeah. but at the, at the moment, you know, being 17, 18 or whatever was like, Hey, this is, this is, you know, you, you don't get to walk up on stage and just feel, you know, or yeah. clown or Can't just not know it. your lines or whatever. And so I was like, okay, I want to, I want to do that because I want to, I want to get to the moment where you, where you do, where you share with somebody. And so, so that you was start, really you start profound. taking it seriously. You start, uh, uh, w- how do you end up becoming uh, associated with the magic theater? Well, I did what everybody does, you know. I mean, I was in, in, in one regard. And the other regard, I had only, I had been introduced by new new plays, did new plays. So that's all I thought of it as. And so that was great. And that's all I've ever done. And then I did what everybody does. I was like, what do you do to become a good actor? And, you know, yeah. oh, everyone goes to New York and they study. And so I went to New York and, I was too undisciplined to really even study. So I just tried to work and, and then I lived there for a few years and then I lived in Los Angeles for a few years. And then my, my mother got sick and I came back to um, San Francisco and my parents, um, my parents were both sick and then they both died. And, you know, creator was telling me something and, and I, I stayed here and it was, necessary to be here obviously for my 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 mom and for my dad but you know as it as life sort of continued to exist I will I looked around here and I was very happy here and this was also um made me rethink what what, well what are you doing and why are you doing it you know when someone when the when the more mortality comes in the way with our work, you know what I mean? And then by that time, I'm still young, you know, I'm under 25, but I'm still cogitating, oh, I'm going to do this. This is my career, man, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You, 
you make the choices and someone goes, well, hey, your mom, your mom's sick. Your mom is probably not going to make it through. I don't know how many more months you going to are you going to go 3000 miles or are you going to go 300 miles away and you're going to do that and you're going to put that focus there and no energy there and no spiritual sense there. And, and I, I stayed here. I'm not painting a picture like and I was the great son. I'm saying that, you know, life and the work of they've, they've informed each other for and, and you, yeah. you got to be you got to have those two things coexist your work and your life in this place in san francisco i i mean i think they informed each other i think life told me what do you want to do do you want to go and, and spend that time in los angeles or do you want to come up here and be with your mom and you know i'm i'm a mama's boy bro so <laughs> you know what i did um and um and i think that that helped me make decisions about you know so-called work and career and stuff and and then doing that with it with a different sort of uh, awakening i was like this is cool here i like i like it here this is you know you grow up and the first thing you think is like i need to break out of here and mm -hmm. you know the first thing mm -hmm. i did when i got on a plane to new york and this back in the day it, it, i got off jfk and went straight to the first phone booth and put however many quarters you had to put in <laughs> hi mom I, I, I started a little sidebar for you, but you know, when I first started out in New York, uh, I graduated, I went to, to grad school, I came came to the city, and within a week, I, I literally kid you not, I'm in my 20s, I pick up a phone and I'm, I was crying on the subway platform yeah. to my mom. I was yeah. crying. <laughs> no, it's, 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 these are good, you know, we have to do things to understand things sometimes, especially, mm -hmm. you know. So slow, slow boys. Campo Santo. Um, tell our tell our listeners what what is the meaning of the name? How did it happen? Who who made it happen? Yeah. What was I the mean, evolution? The, the the journey of it is after doing work and new work is that he, 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 there has to be there has to be a purpose for it. And the purpose could be like to get gigs, and the purpose to be get paid, the purpose could be to have a career all all viable and all real things the purpose for me and especially you know as i sort of tell the thing like choosing or wanting and being able to stay in, in the city i grew up in was then you know well, why am, why am i going to do it here what am i going to do here and i had been working here uh a couple of years before my, my mother passed and um it was cool, you know, getting to work and then getting to work more and working at, at, you know, primarily at Magic Theater doing, you know, as an actor. And it was really exciting. It's really fulfilling. But at a certain point, it, it, it the where you are in the circle becomes really clear. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's no there's no centering of you, your culture your language certainly not barely phenotype and then also what it means like well then what are you representing and what you know whose stories are being told and why are they being told all very righteous talk and not anything that everyone needs to do i knew pretty clearly and pretty strongly that that's what that's what drew me to the thing is the the reflection and the reflection has to be a reflection and after doing you know after a while, you're like, this isn't quite a reflection, you know, this is not accurate. I, I come from a metropolitan city. I come from a port city. And the the worlds being portrayed on stages, stages that I admired, they're not accurate. They're not real. And therefore, they're not creatively full. And so it, there, that was hanging in the, in, in the head and the heart. And then you start reading, you know, Michael, this is like, early 1990s man i mean first of all people people have been dope writers forever but at that period motherfuckers were busting out and there was a lot of money and support for new new play you know the 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 big theaters got hip that oh we could get a little maybe we should do new plays so we get new audiences the age old you know the age old thing in, in, in the tired American theater. And so there was a lot 
of work being generated. There was not a lot of work being produced. But the, the fruits of that was that, you know, I, 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 we were meeting like all kinds of great writers and all kinds of incredible plays and pieces. And after years of doing that, you're like, these plays are ready. And then you go the route, like, I'm going to pitch this to you. I'm going to do a reading for you and this, that, and the other. I had, I was really lucky. I had a really great relationship at Magic Theater of all places under the great Mame Hunt. Mame Hunt loved writers. And Mame, you know, uh, was really kind to me and let me tell her my opinion, you know, put me in things. And so we were sitting, it was four of us that had met each other through the world. The late and even greater Louis Saguar. Dame Margot Hall, fantastic uh, artistic director of Lorraine Hansberry Theater out here in the Bay Area, incredible actor and director, and Michael Torres. And the four of us just knew each other. And we were like, there's all these plays. And, and we just realized through, basically just through chopping it up. All like this, this play does this, it's really interesting. And then the more you talked about it, you know, because that's the great thing about new play development is you just get in the circle and you read and you talk and you read and you talk and you read and you talk. There isn't this sort of push towards perfection or production. And in doing so, you learn about each other, you learn about the play for sure, and then you learn about the world. And in doing all these conversations, we're like, we actually know how to do, we could do this. We, we Obviously, we know who to cast and I'm not in a vanity project way. The Bay Area is filled with, with great actors. We know to cast, but more than that, it was writers writing so imaginatively that their words were creating the world, you know? And that might, at this point in, in our creative involvement of performance, you're like, duh, that's what it's supposed to do. But you got to imagine, you know, the, the pull of the, the kitchen sink drama is large, you know what I mean? And so this idea that people could just like bust out walls, literally, figuratively, culturally, spiritually was really great, but we could see it. And so we finally were just like, let's go, let's, let's do, do one, let's, let's do, do one. Ourselves. And we were just like, let's do one. Uh -huh. And if we do one, that'll be good. And we did one and this, it was less like, we're so dope. I mean, it was pretty dope because we have like all the, we have some really great people. But the, the, the part that gives you hope is that we were in this tiny spot. And I love that. I don't mean like we're in a little tiny spot. We're in this tiny spot so everyone could feel everything. Everyone could see everything. And it just, it just caught fire. And there were people showing up and showing up. And it wasn't like, oh, those four actors we know got some other actors together. We'll be on the actor tip and we'll support them. It was like people you didn't know, people you hadn't met people you didn't know was into theater and it, and where are you performing you said in a tiny little spot it was a it was where? a place called new Langton arts and in san francisco before before the first dot com dot com boom there was a, a neighborhood that they had called south of market which was like you know it was like industrial a lot of spots and new Langton arts had been this long long ago great small you know, storefront gallery and over the years had this backspace with concrete floor and no grid, but some lights. And they had a, a, a bank of seats that could seat about 50 people. And we did it in this, and it was, but it was, it was less that we're even, Michael, you know, the tip. it wasn't even that we're like, we'll just find a spot and we'll, we'll make it work. It was that, that was the aesthetic we wanted. We wanted it stripped. We wanted you to just hear the words. We wanted to go back to the basics. And so that, that, that name Campo Santo for us, you know, it can mean graveyard. It's like a gathering of saints. So we're, we're talking about it's a sacred ground. Mm -hmm. You know, we're from the Bay, so it's a little like that. But it's also like we're being, you know, our cities, our cities are under siege, right? You know, our cities are being stolen from us every day. But the ghost, the spirits, creator, that will never go away. Ancestry will never go away. The stories will never go away. And so there was this notion of, oh, we have this place that we can come to and, and, th and that and those things can live there. And it's interesting, like, that's what I, I, I feel like in, in the sort of B side of that record, Coriolanus kind of does that. It's like, we're going to come together and we're going to fight. We're going to fight for what the city is. I mean, it's definitely not what we do, but in, in, in that sense. 
But that's what became really cool about Martin was like, anyone could do it because th there are so many writers and there are so many great artists. And, and then what you find out is that there actually is a community for that. Um, and so that, and we, we've been doing it for more than 25 years, so. I had a little suit I wore, a, a tuxedo. I must have been about six or seven. I looked like a midget, but I wasn't. I was just a little boy, nothing special about me. <laughs> a red tuxedo, red like blood, with a rose on the lapel. A suit bathed in the blood of Christ, they would say. Oh. Had a little pose, I did. <laughs> so Campo Santo is still running, still going. Yeah. Yeah, You're, you still have a hand in it, even as artistic director of the Magic. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that I, I, I asked uh, when I was able to get this incredible job at Magic Theater was like, you know, they were like, "Well, what, how would you separate what you do with Campo Santo from what you could do with Magic?" And I, I, my response is, I wouldn't separate them at all. Why would we? Why would we compartmentalize ourselves? Why wouldn't we? open it all up and learn from each other. We all eat. It's a win-win. That's what it should be. It should be a, a space where as many of us as possible are there. So Combo Santo, in, in a more practical terms, is the home resident company of, of Magic Theater. And that's what it should be. I mean, I, I was introduced to the true power of, the, of theater making. When I, I drove down from San Francisco the first time, I went to the old Los Angeles Theater Center, LATC, and I had, I had come in, and for folks that don't know, it's in the old bank mm -hmm. in downtown, and at that point, downtown funky, downtown you know, Cuddy, I know, I Los Angeles. It well. And I came in through an elevator and ended up on the, the top floor, but the top floor looked down at the lobby, and there were hundreds of people. There was a bar and there were hundreds of people just jamming around. And then they started going into three different spaces. And I was like, this is a theater. It's not a club. It's not a restaurant. Look at all these people. I'm, I was a kid. I had to be like 18 or, or 19. And I was I was out of my mind before it started because that was the energy. I was like, oh, shit, this is the energy of what a city is. And now it's in the lobby. And that means it's going to be. And then. That weekend, I saw two things. I saw Culture Clash, Bowl of Beans. Hey, Chewy, how you like the way I look? I just got my Santeria kit today. <laughs> I got 1-900 voodoo. <laughs> I got to pick you up tonight. Okay. Tonight, we are going to dance una salsita caliente, mano. Mm. Celia Cruz, Celia Cruz. And I saw the great, late, great Reza Abdo's company, Dara Luce. Boogeyman. Ah, would you read this for me, pretty lady? It's one of those damn shows where they come right out of the audience and talk to you. Make your dance with them. I hate those, don't you? And my shit has never been the same since. But to know it, it, it was both of those things that were necessary. That lobby full of those people and then the work that sort of was meeting that. So it wasn't like all these people came and they go, we're going to do a production of uh, you know, we're going to, you're going to see a Moliere production. You're going to see a new, you know, version of John Chanley. Play. You know, it wasn't like, it was like, no, man, this is, this is the, 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 Speaking the downness of the, of the down. The audience, yeah. The and the audience was wild and, and varied and very much Los Angeles of whatever that was, 1993 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what it should, you know, that's what, that's what our, our work is supposed to be you know, the, the, the populist vibe. I mean, that's yeah. what I should have said about Corey Lane. So that's what I, 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 that's what I hit on. I thought it was like a, a pop, a piece about populism, you know, and I'm not a great breaker down of, of Shakespeare, but I knew that much of it from reading that first scene. Let's, let's talk about it. Um, you, when we started talking initially, you were, uh, very, very clear that you wanted women in the cast. You wanted uh, non-binary casting, you know, gender non-conforming and, and uh, very purposeful um, in terms of how to get as much representation uh, in, in our casting as possible. 
how did we end up with an all female or non-binary cast? What was, what was, I, I know this was a in collaboration, but what got that started and tell, tell us the reason behind it for you. Yeah, that's, that's really great. I mean, cause that really is, that's kind of the, the fuel for me of this whole translation process. As we talked about the translations were, were set up really clearly and, and cleanly. And I think it was, that was the mission of it to come away with basically a new library version that audiences ears can, can be more receptive to, which isn't to say like, you, you know, the peers are like, you're going to dumb it down. You know, it's like, no, we're just, we're going to make resonant things that don't make sense at first or second blush to us. Because why would, why would you want, why would you want to confuse people? Why would you want people not to know a thing? You want them to figure it out if they can write it down and remember and go home and write about it. And so outside of the live experience, you can understand it. So it's solely an intellectual and academic thing. So it really was like, how do you make the language live a, a little bit more directly here? And, you know, so anyway, that, that, that was that thing. And again, I, I'm, I'm not the ideal candidate, Michael, for the gig. Like, as you can hear, I barely know the character names coming into it. <laughs> It, but I knew what I, I knew what was at the core of the thing. But what was really the fuel for me doing the translation was this 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 notion of populism. And for me, the whole hit was like, look, if it's not an adaptation, I need to be writing this. If we're trying to lift our ears to hear it better, we have to have to know who's whose ears to whom are we speaking, which, which to me means. I'm not going to do a translation so it can live for the same white theater audience that are exclusive to just subscribers of this certain genre of things. I, that's not a translation. That's just a different version of the same old thing. And that's not bad, but it already exists. And that's not, that has, that doesn't resonate for me. And if I get the task of doing the thing, it needs to, it needs to live differently. So it, it thought, at the at the heart of it, I was imagining it out. And again, I wasn't changing character names or things like that, but that the world looked like a city that I live in. And so there was that part of it. So that it it has to be representative uh, of our world. Like how how could you how could anyone do a play in the last 50 years that doesn't have people of color or queer folks in it? Like then you, I don't know what you, I don't know what you're doing and that I'm doing that is the same thing. I, I, I don't know. We're doing two different things. Yes, we both have texts and we recite them, but you're doing something that is, is taking away things from the real world. And if you don't have that, it doesn't mean that that needs to be what it's about. But if that energy, ethos, spirit, culture isn't in the room, then, then what do you what are you really doing? I, I'm I, I I say that not as a challenge, but because I, I'm I'm confused because mm -hmm. I'm not going to show up for it because it's I have other things to to work my imagine in a purely imaginative way. I have other things that will work my imagination, like looking at the sky, like looking at the mm -hmm. ocean. But to look at a play that is about verisimilitude, that is about reflection, that is about some sort of facsimile of our real life. And then you're consciously taking out component pieces of culture, history, ancestry, gender. I mean, it's just, it's so bonkers to me. And so that's part of, you know, the, the thing about Shakespeare. Like, how are you going to do some shit that has two women, 58 men? You know, how are you going to do some shit that has no cultural belongings to anyone outside of European ancestry? How are you going to do something that only eludes to sexuality outside of you know the male normative hetero shit i it's just like huh i mean and it just makes you do these leaps i'm not saying it can't exist but i'm an audience member i don't want to have to do i don't have to walk the four gates before i can get to i'm too impatient doesn't mean that that's not good or not it's just i'm too impatient i want to know huh. and so, so i say all that to say is that in in writing it that that's what i was populating the world that, that it you, were, like you were seeing women as you were translating it. 
Yeah. And in, in the and also very specifically about women, I and mean, part of it was an exterior thing. I was just like, how can you do Shakespeare and and not have part of the translation needs to be like the the dopest people are out there are women. You know, I was raised by women, so I know where wisdom comes from. Talk and about then, that. Talk about that because that that had so much to do with uh, the vision for the piece, as I recall, in our conversations and the conversations you had with the creative team, yeah. the casting team, all of that. Can you go into that? For yeah, us? I mean, part of it for me, a big part of as we got to spend more time with Coriolanus and then the idea that it would be beyond a translation that lives on a page in a library somewhere is that, well, what is it? What does it live like? And I think part of it then becomes both for the Shakespeare you know, knowledgeable people, but also when you describe what it's about a warrior comes back, it's so it's so fraught for me with this sort of male imagery, this testosterone drip, you know, the and then the subsequent toxicity of it, but more so just our imaginings of it, that is. And I think in doing so, it sort of it sort of fills in the story for you. And the story is so gray and muddy for me in reading it. Like I'm not down for Coriolanus, but but it, I, I really listened to Coriolanus. And if I'm going in going like, oh, Coriolanus is about this pig that does this, um, then it's just not as complex a journey. But, and a lot of that has to do for me is, you know, our sort of binary understandings of things. And so I think a lot of it is in the play way, making way, it's like Julius Caesar's dude, you know, Othello's a dude, you know what I mean? King Lear's a dude. And, and it's more the, the, the war ones, you know, and that we think and that we can explain away the actions to things like, you know, male toxicity, to machismo, whatever, whatever, whatever. But I think if we have to, if we pull that out and then we empower, uh, you know, great strong actors and they're also void of a sort of aural or visual imagery of going like, oh, that's a man. And I, I know what that represents and I know what that does in a play making world and now i'll watch the rest you're already like 70 percent in and there's only 30 percent to gain if we're sort of wiping it clear a little bit i think you can you can hear it better and you can challenge everyone that that's working on it go okay what are what are real what are the real component pieces what are the real thematics that we're fucking with and let's dig into those and then we all whether you know Coriolanus or not have to hear it anew so i felt it was really important from the beginning that it was always, it was always women that were telling the story because it's such a, I think part of the reason maybe people <laughs> don't think they like it as much or think that they get what the story is, is because it, it's, it's part of it is like this warrior thing. And I think that's interesting to a degree, but it's much more fascinating, the stuff that actually happens in it to me. You mentioned earlier that you were raised by women. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? I mean, uh, uh, you know, like I said, I come from a big family, so obviously my mom raised me, but when my titas and my certainly my Lola raised me, and I, uh, my family was run by women, so and we're a big family, and they they, they all raised me. I mean, simply, simply, and 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 also practically, and and then you know, when I came to some sort of consciousness, I realized that I was like, oh. I've, I've been I've been touched by um, uh, a grace, you know, and a strength of, of these women. No, so your core, your core culture, your core um, beginning was governed by women. You have absolutely. been in a world governed by women. Yeah, and and women that 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 not only ran the world but had to, you know, uh, we're we're fobs like for real fobs. My my. my my grandmother came on a boat from Manila to the port of San Francisco with her mom. Her, her mom obviously couldn't speak, not obviously, but couldn't speak, couldn't speak English. My grandmother, you know, 14 year old, spoke seven languages, walked the streets of San Francisco with her, her mom and then raised, you know, went back and forth from Philippines to San Francisco, raised a family, eight kids. And she did the thing. She did the thing. And that's the kind of world that I grew up, I, you know, and I grew up in a house with my mom, not, not my dad, my mom. 
and you know was raised by my mom and one of my my aunties and and so that you know everything was I mean thank goodness because I wouldn't have survived so on that end it was pulling the, the scruff on my neck to keep me alive but also you know like I say having survived and gained some sort of consciousness I realized the the, the power and the gift of, the, of, of all that do you and feel so, it operating in you as as now you're running a theater right you're you're in charge yeah. um does your way of governing that theater how 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 has that influenced you in in terms of how you govern the theater the the, the way you were raised and how you now run yeah. the magic well i mean i think that the, the 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 world should be run that way um i mean all the my family certainly that that was foundationally what has made me but also anything that i work i i i've learned from smart strong women and women leaders um, like I had mentioned, Mame Hunt as an artistic director of, of Magic Theater, and and then you know more recently Loretta Greco, but really very prominently Campo Santo. Our group wouldn't have existed without really strong leadership, vision, and love from Deborah Cullinan, who ran a place called Intersection for the Arts. She now runs Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, but it was her leadership and leadership as a woman, very clearly as a woman leading it. You know, um, you know, when I mentioned all these play labs I used to go to, those were run by the the late great Diane Rodriguez and, and oh. Luis Alfaro, of course. But you know, that having that that energy. So I think that that's that that's in there, uh, in 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 blueprint form, but also really directly, but it's just a necessity, Marco. You know that you're mm -hmm. you're a smart dude. You're a sensible dude. <laughs> um, that that you want that. I mean, Margot Hall is is you know the 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 voice of our group in a lot of ways in Campo Santo, and our group consciously has to do that. I mean, there's a thing I have to fight against. So I'm a you know I, I, I'm I'm a, a male too, so I I, I like to be conscious of that i talk a lot you know so that you know you want to you want to spread things around but it, it's more it's more that we try and operate things as as you would an, a nice house party and mm -hmm. all the best house parties I, i've ever been to or you know you know like all households run by women not all households i'm talking about me so mm -hmm. there's that basic sensibility in there yeah so i think that that it comes through in, in, in that regard have you been uh listening to the podcast as they've come out have oh, yeah. you yeah yeah, yeah. And, and how does it how how is it sounding to you what's your what's your feeling hearing it well you know what's been incredible about the, the whole journey of it is that and this is what the, the really exciting thing about the the medium too is it really allows us it's very similar to the whole genesis of me being involved in Coriolanus at all is that each iteration, a new, a new, a new. And so by the time we got to podcast, I, I had been fortunate. Louis Duthat had taken us through multiple workshops and there was a big festival in New York a few years ago where all the translations were read. And so I had seen it and been in rooms where the words were alive with actors and audience. But there was something great, not only about, uh, uh, I mean, first of all, it's like the most dynamic, dopest cast ever assembled like it's insane how you know it's dreamcast so just hearing actors like that you know I, i'm not i'm not listening to anything i'm just experiencing it if that makes sense meaning i'm not going like do i need to change that or well, does that make sense i'm just <laughs> i'm just feeling it and experiencing it but also you know amrita did all this incredible work with it that's amrita ramanan who is the dramaturg on coriolanus Continue. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No. And Kate, they both did the. Kate Wisniewski, our director. Yes, <laughs> they both did the. You know, it becomes a truly collaborative. You know, and that I mean, all the pro. This is what I mean when I said originally, like it's Shakespeare, but it's a new play. Now, my understanding of having done plays that aren't new plays is like locked and loaded. Boom. 
let the one person run with it and everyone does their thing. This was, you know, was broken up, was rewritten, was uh, adapted, adjusted, infused th throughout and really largely it, with the work that Kate and Anrita were doing with everything. And I don't just mean like tell the actor to do it this way. I'm talking about the, the, the tech, the text of it. So that was like, that, that's, that's been an amazing thing. And like, as a, a person working on a thing, a, a gift, because I really can, you can be at the table. That's to me, that's, that's theater making, being around the table together. And so mm -hmm. then I'm not going, Michael, I asked you, get me someone that's, <laughs> loud to play this part that you go like i think it's this what do you think mm -hmm. and that you know and everyone goes that makes sense that doesn't make sense yeah. i mean and kate's ex it the way that it worked and also working with you i mean look anyone listening should know like this is the way of the world people you can be stale and you can be old and you can be tied to the old ways which are tied to the old white supremacist ways or you can do what what, what you guys are doing which was like Let's do some new shit. Let's do new new ways and just make the work great. I say that to say directly, like when I was like, hey, you, you're going to do the the podcast of, of a play that I did a translation of, of one that people don't even produce. <laughs> and that I was like, oh, please, could we have it? You know, it, it, it needs to be filled with people of color, WOCs. And it would be great if it's all women and all non-binary and could we go like that and we made a list dude mm -hmm. i'll go through the text we had a list of about 24 acts that you, you you made to find the right people to to lead this mm -hmm. thing and you know I, i'm ever grateful for that and that ethos followed in how we cast it so it wasn't a room where i sat on a lectern and said I've lived my, you know, is anyone that has gone this far in the podcast and heard me tell my my life and saying, therefore, thus theater exists this way. It was a room full of people going, I feel that that makes mm -hmm. sense. I, too, agree about representation and reflection and how it can work with creating great art. Let's do that. I know the people who can do this, this, that and the other. And it's not like the crazy thing, Michael, is, you know, we we didn't have to, you know, go hunting for treasure. We just had to agree what the vision was and then we populated it. That's Meaning right. like the idea that you would do a thing with incredible dope, you know, led by women of color and having all women and all nine binary people. And it wasn't, it wasn't a task. That was just what we were doing. And then they, they fulfilled, they came with the gold after that. You know what I mean? And so anyone that's looking at this stuff going like, that's a way out way. That's not a way out. The, the future is now. And th mm -hmm. this should not be looked at as like, oh, that's an interesting way to look at it. this. Is, that's how you look at it. Mm -hmm. Punto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen, we could talk all day. I know that. <laughs> but, and, and I, I, you know, I'd love to keep talking to you, but we do have to wrap it up. So I just want to I want to land here. OK, um, we'll, we'll, we'll end where we started. Right. The, the world is what it is. Um, we, we hear the verdict today. Uh, and, and there are artists emerging into the world today. What can you tell a young person who's going in to this world to make art? You, Sean San Jose, what, what can you offer them in the way of advice, guidance? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you, you, if you're doing the kind of stuff that we're doing, you have to want to do it. So this ain't a gig. This ain't, this ain't a job. This is, this is a, a need. And for me, it's a need to be part of the civic cultural world that I live in. And it's a way to plug in to that, to give, to give voice. And so the, the advice is if you don't have something that, that is, isn't vibrating in you, that needs to vibrate with other people, that, then you really have to re, Rethink this kind of storytelling. There are other storytellings that you could do, but there's there's a great need for for us in our representation. And if we're not telling our stories, our grandmother's stories, then then I, I beg of you to tell me. Then what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Because we 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 have to save our cities, and we have to uh, 
let spirit live. You know, it sounds a little like, oh, that's no, it, it can be done. To think that we're powerless is a mistake. And I think to think that as artists, we're in a corner or that we're ethereal is is wrong. We're actually we're part of the conversation. So be part of the conversation. If you're not part of the conversation, you're not you're not fulfilling your abilities. Beautifully stated. Uh, and I thank you so much for collaborating with Next Chapter Podcast, with Play On Podcast, with me, with Miriam Lauba, with Kate Wisniewski, our director, uh, and uh, Daniel Benjamin, Sadaharu Yagi, uh, Larry Walsh, our sound design team. Wow. Uh, all the incredible people that were yeah. a part of this and that you helped coalesce into this incredible work of art that uh, our listeners are getting to enjoy today. Yeah. Thank you, Sean San Jose. Thank you. Thank you, everyone that, that created this and everyone that will listen to it.